I'd like to invite you to turn over your bulletin right now to the, to the back, where you're going to find today's scripture reading that you've just heard, the compass that will discuss, the guide of our discussion this morning, and also a place in which to take notes. And I know some of you do, and some of you don't, but today I'm going to put down the expectation right now that I expect everyone to use this space right now. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a pen or a pencil out of the pews. Every one of you has a pencil in the pew in front of you. I want you to take that out right now, and I want you to draw a line down the middle. Draw a line about halfway wide out of this space from top to bottom. Okay? Draw a line. Now, on the left side of this line, uh, over here on the left side of the line, I want you to uh, take just a minute and write down ten specific blessings that have happened to you in the last week. Ten blessings that have occurred in your life in this last week. From the time you left your church last Sunday to right now, ten blessings that have happened in your life in the last week. Just make a little note of what each of those are. Maybe a word or a phrase that will help you remember those blessings and write down your ten blessings right now on that piece of paper. I'm going to give you just a minute to do that. I have a use for the other side of that line when you have your tenant. On the other side of that line, I want you to write down right now, take just a minute, and write down on the right hand side of this line ten problems, ten worries that you have right now, ten specific worries, just a word or a phrase of worry that's occupying your mind right now. Is it something in your own life or something in the life of the world? Write down 10 worries right now on the right hand side of this line. When you have your 10, just look back up at me and I'll know what thing. I want to talk to you for a minute about the gospel reading of Jesus from Luke 17. As we come into this passage here at the top of the page, we encounter Jesus as he's making a journey. He's traveling to Jerusalem. And this journey takes 10 chapters in Luke's gospel to complete. Along the way, in Luke's Gospel, in these ten chapters, you will find some of your favorite Bible stories. Those stories you love to hear again and again, and those stories you love to tell are all wrapped up in these ten chapters. Maybe it's the Good Samaritan is a favorite of yours. Maybe the prodigal son. Luke takes miracles and parables and he puts them all into this one trip that Jesus is making on the road to Jerusalem. And he puts them in a particular order. Some of the stories you will find in Matthew's Gospel and Mark's Gospel too. But others, like this one, you will find nowhere else. Only in the Gospel according to Luke is this story found. In Jesus' day, 
leprosy referred to any disease, any skin disease that might appear on the human body. They didn't have specific medical definitions for it, but if you had a skin disease, you were a leper. Today, we understand leprosy as a very scientific term. To be a leper is to have something called a Hansen's disease, a very specific skin condition. But back then, any affliction of the skin could be called leprosy. You might get a rash. You might become a leper. A person who was afflicted as a leper would be declared ceremonially unclean. Now, this wasn't done by their doctor or their physician. It was a sacred uh, declaration. It was made by the priest in the temple of the synagogue in your, in your town. You would go to them and they would declare you ceremonially unclean and then they would banish you from the community. If you were a leper, they would kick you out. You could no longer interact with your families or your children. You could no longer see your friends. You could no longer work or carry on your daily business. You had to leave town and leave it. There was no way around it. And they did this because they were afraid of leprosy. They didn't understand these conditions like we do today. They were afraid that your proximity to others would well was catching. And they did it too. So they did the only thing they knew how to do. They got rid of you. They kicked you out of town. And if you were a leper, uh, you would often find yourself in the company of other lepers. It wasn't easy to survive out on the open road by yourself. So lepers would come together and they would form new communities. They would form their own little bands and societies outside of the villages. They did this so that they would, there was safety in numbers and there was a greater chance that they would survive outside the safety of a village and town walls and security. And their bands were comprised of people who wouldn't be seen together on any other ordinary situation. People from different walks of life, different social classes, different races and ethnicities would band together because for the lepers, none of that mattered anymore. None of that was important. They were bound together in a new way. A way that they shared because they were set apart from the rest of their former societies. And you could find these bands of lepers not too far from village gates. They would come near the roadside where they would beg for a bit of food or money. And then they would pool those resources and they would share them with each other in order to, to survive. As together they hoped and prayed that their shared afflictions might depart from them. Now the law, the section of the Hebrew Bible uh, that covers Deuteronomy and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, those conditions about how to live rightly, uh, dictates that lepers have to stay a distance from ordinary people, from regular, safe, clean, uninfected people. That distance is about the equivalent of a football field. Lepers could not be within a football field of regular people for fear of infection. So here we have Jesus walking toward a village on the border between Samaria and Galilee. And these ten lepers who are banded together somewhere outside the town gates, they see him. Come. And since Jesus is making his trip to Jerusalem, the big journey in Luke's gospel, we know that he's not traveling by himself. The disciples were with him. And Jesus never traveled with just the twelve very often. There are others with him too. The women who supported his ministry and so many more. He's traveling in a crowd. So he's easy to spot as he's coming along. And they know him by reputation or maybe by sight from former times in their lives. And so they call out to him from a distance. They say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. These lepers knew something. That they, they knew that Jesus was capable of helping them even from far away when nobody else could. And what does he do? He cleanses them, right? He heals them. The scripture is very clear about that. He sends them back to the priests. Those with the ability to declare a person unclean are also the only people with the 
the ability to declare them clean again. If you were healed of leprosy, you had to go back to the temple, the synagogue, before you could go anywhere else, you had to get a certificate from the priest, which declared you clean. And then you could go back to resuming your ordinary, everyday life. So they went to the priests, all ten of them, so that they could go back and resume the lives that they had left behind. And as they made their way toward the village to present themselves to the priests for inspection, the scripture says that their skin conditions left them. And they were cleansed. They were healed. And nine of them, after receiving their certificates of cleanliness from the priests, are never heard from again. They disappear from the story. But one comes back. One of them comes back. And he doesn't keep his distance anymore, does he? The scripture is very clear that he runs to Jesus. And he falls to his knees before him and he praises God, it says, in a loud and clear voice. He is profoundly grateful for the blessing which Jesus has bestowed on him. He makes a note of it. He, he takes it down and counts his blessing. And he gives God all the glory for this new experience of life. And then Jesus says to him, get up and go. Your faith has made you well. Now in the text, if you were to read six different translations of the Bible, and the Gospel according to Luke, and read this passage which is written right here, you will find different words throughout. And the translation which I picked here is an outlier. It uses the word heal multiple times. It uses it at the end. It says your faith is healed. And it uses it up above where Jesus, it talks about Jesus cleansing them. They were healed. But every other passage I found uses heal up the top and made well or saved at the bottom. Words are important. Words matter. And heal and made well are not the same thing. In Greek, the words that we translate to be healed and to be made well do not mean the same thing. To be healed uh, means you have been cured. You have been given a remedy to a specific condition. That's what it means to be healed. The word we translate as healed in the scripture. But to be made well is to be made whole. To be made well is to be saved. When you are healed, you are not saved. But to, when you are made well, you are saved. You are made whole. You recover, not just in body and your specific affliction, but also in mind and spirit and heart and soul. So in this passage, ten people get healed. But only one person gets saved. Only one person gets saved. I want you to look at the bulletin that you have here, the line of your lists. Look at those lists right now. Look down on those lists right now. And which list was easier for you to write? Was it faster for you to write out those ten specific blessings that have happened to you in the last seven days? Or were you faster at writing down those problems, those worries, those concerns that occupied your mind? Which list was quicker for you to compose? For nine of the lepers who were healed that day, they focused on the list of the right. Their priority was their own concern, their own need, getting back to the lives that they had left behind, returning to the security and the comfort that they had formerly known. So once they are healed, they disappear. They're gone. And the only mention they get is Jesus wondering where they went. But one came back. One came back. For this one leper, he comes back and he falls at Jesus' feet and he praises God and he gives thanks and glory to God for what has been done to him. And Jesus says, your faith has saved you. This one adopts a spirit of gratitude, of thanksgiving for a new life. 
that has been bestowed upon him. And that new thing trumps everything else in his mind. And I think it's like that for us too. The problems in our lives, that list on the right consumes a lot of our time, doesn't it? You ever notice when we uh, give joys and concerns in the morning that if you were to sit down and write them out as you went along, there's more concerns typically than there are joys? Why is that? Are our lives really so terrible? Or are, is our focus on one thing and not the other? Are we missing a picture of wholeness? A complete picture of who God calls us to be as Christians, as servants, as children. How many more conversations do you have in any given day with people that you know uh, at, at the restaurant or at home or at church or anywhere else where uh, you find it that you talk more about sharing worries and problems and commiserating than you do sharing joys and gratitude? How many more conversations do you have where frets are expressed than praise on any given day? I think you'll find when any group of people gather together, it's just human nature. We bond over our problems, right? Sympathy loves company. The saying goes, sympathy loves company. And so we focus on our challenges, our problems, more often than we do on the gratitude. We, have, we focus on the things that are still wrong instead of the things that have been made right. In Christian communities, we have this tendency to talk an awful lot about sin, especially the sins of the world, the sins of other people, the sins that we ourselves dare not commit, but them over there, well, sins are problems that we see that don't seem to go away. But when we do that, when we focus on this list of the right of Christians, and we neglect this list of the left, we're forgetting something very, very important. Sin is not the point anymore for us. Do you get that? Sin is not the point anymore. That's not what we're to be preoccupied with anymore. It's not our major concern because Christ didn't come only to heal our problems. He came and He gave His life to save us. Christ came to make us whole. He didn't come to fix our problems. He came to make us whole. To restore us in the image that God had in mind all along. Because it's in Him, not in us, that we are made well. The transformation of the world that we talk about, that thing listed on the front of our bulletin as our mission statement, isn't about fixing our problems. It's about making all things new in Christ. Making all things whole through the love of God. It's about helping those who are hurting and suffering to be made well in body, mind, and soul, and heart. It's about new life and new opportunity. And that's the gift that we have been given. There's something else that's interesting about this one who comes back. See, the first nine, the scripture tells us, well, they're just like Jesus. They are Jews, right? And they know the protocol. They know that they are to go and present themselves to the priests. And they do that. They go and they present themselves to the priests. And they get their certificates. And they go on their way. But this one who comes back, one of these outcasts is a double outcast. Not only is he a leper who is cleansed and healed, he is a Samaritan. So for him, going back to the status quo, to the way things were, to be an outsider even in the midst of society, yet again, well, that just wouldn't do. That wouldn't do. That wasn't good enough to go back to the way things were. He saw something better, and he ran. He fell at Jesus' feet, and he embraced what God had done for him. In his praise and his thanksgiving, he recognizes that it's not his own power anymore. It's God's power and God's grace and God's healing that gets it done through that you say, Jesus says. This outcast among outcasts found the thing that everybody else missed. That thing that all of us in the world today who are hurting and broken are still seeking. This American found salvation. He was made whole in body, mind, and soul, and spirit. 
And for him, the world, when he left this place with Jesus, would never be the same again. Because for him, life became about the list on the left, counting blessings. That was the important part. The problems on the right, the problems that remained, were surmountable. Every one of them. Because God was in control. And by the grace of God, he and we can find new life. What about you? Which list preoccupies your mind? When one of those blessings on the left has come and gone, do you, do you find it easier to go back to that list on the right every ordinary day and focus on that or worry about that? Focusing on those problems or maybe sins that are beyond our control? Or in your praise and thanksgiving, will you find yourself truly to be saved? Will you offer that salvation to others in Jesus' name that they might find it too? Or will you simply go back to preaching to the choir about how everything is so messed up in the world while you wait for God to do something about it? Will you be the one intent 